Tonight, after weeks of brinksmanship, posturing, and intense negotiation, President Biden will soon sign into law a bipartisan bill that lifts the country's debt limit and averts what could have been an economic disaster. The president spoke about the bill's significance a short time ago. No one got everything they wanted, but the American people got what they needed. We averted an economic crisis. That bill, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, was negotiated between President Biden and Speaker McCarthy and their teams. It passed the House overwhelmingly on Wednesday and was rushed through the Senate late Thursday. Joining us now to discuss this and more, Peter Baker is chief White House correspondent for The New York Times. Leanne Caldwell is co-author of The Washington Post's Early 202 and anchor of Washington Post Live. Asma Khalid is White House correspondent for NPR and co-host of the NPR Politics Podcast. And Nicole Killian is congressional correspondent for CBS News. Welcome to you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Peter, uh, to you first. Uh, does the passage of this deal and the eventual soon-to-be signing by the president tell us anything new about President Biden and how he and his White House team operate? Well, I think what it tells us is that President Biden, of course, has now been able to burnish his reputation for bipartisanship. This is important to him. It's part of his identity, his political identity. It's part of his case for re-election next year. I'm the adult in the room at a time of lots of fractious uh, fighting among the parties. It doesn't necessarily match the de desires and priorities of his own party. A lot of his House Democrats would have preferred he be more of a fighter, less of a compromiser. But for him, you saw him tonight give that speech in which he made clear that his priority is being seen as somebody who rises above the partisanship in the, in the nation's interest. Asma, do you see the same way that, that the president tonight really defended how he held back what was a Republican attack on what he thinks of as his legislative priorities? Is that what he thinks of as victory? Uh, certainly. And I would echo what Peter said. I mean, in many ways, he emphasized the fact tonight that he ran uh, his 2020 presidential campaign as being someone who could find consensus, who would help the nation find unity. Uh, and, and he believes in bipartisanship still. He echoed those very similar themes this evening. Um, you know, what I also heard from him, though, too, was a sense of to your point, what he was able to defend, right? That he was able to protect Medicaid to some degree. He was able to protect Social Security. And to me, those were messages directed toward a larger possible uh, 2024 electorate, just so folks would be aware of where his um, ambitions are, I think, leading up into the reelect. Leanne, though, he, he did say for many months, I am not going to negotiate on this debt limit, and then he did. Uh, does that open up the future of what he calls hostage taking to become the norm by how he operated. Well, let me back up just a little bit. It's really interesting. In the middle of these negotiations, Democrats were very angry that he, in fact, did engage in these negotiations. He, they thought, as Speaker McCarthy was coming out talking to the press all day long, every single day, really dominating the narrative, there were members of his party, including Sheila Jackson Lee, who stood up in a closed door conference meeting and asked. Hakeem Jeffries, the minority leader, to ask President Biden, please address the nation, do an address to the nation, put pressure on these Republicans. And the White House did not do that. And now he did this address tonight to claim victory, to use it as an opportunity, as Ozma said, to talk about his priorities, what he's accomplished and what he's been able to fight back. But I will say that there's a lot of concern on Capitol Hill about what sort of precedent this creates. There's a lot of members on the right and the conservative faction of the party who are very angry that this debt limit is suspended to 2025 because they say that Kevin McCarthy gave away his leverage to try to reform government spending. And so this might set a, another precedent for depending on who's in power in two years. And I would argue, too, I mean, in talking to Senate Democrats, I mean, on the other side of the aisle, many of them told me they actually think going forward that the 14th Amendment should be invoked. We know that was a debate but He during... should have used that to get out well, of no, this. Well, no, for future debates, because, ah. you know, from their standpoint, they don't want to be subject to hostage taking the next time around from their point of view. And so, obviously, we know the president argued that the 14th Amendment didn't have time to, you know, vet it out. It could be subject to legal challenges. But now, when you're looking two years out, you know, whether it's Bernie Sanders, Jeff Merkley, a number of senators told me they still feel that that should be an option on the table going forward. I also think there are questions, too, about what this means for the broader state of the U.S. economy, right? You saw Fitch, the ratings uh, agency 
agency today warned that it is not necessarily taking the idea off the table that it would downgrade the U.S. credit rating. Simply uh, that, because of the way we exactly, behaved as a nation. Exactly. And that this doesn't necessarily preclude that they're worried about sort of future political fallout of this sort. And to me, that's really interesting because you're hearing President Biden declare this as a political victory, but you don't get a sense that the sort of domestic economy feels that way definitively yet. It doesn't actually end the debate, right? It takes a debt ceiling off the table now for two years, but that doesn't mean that the budget issues that they resolved are actually resolved, because you already hear people talking about going back to the well, right? You heard the president tonight say, I want to come back on taxes for the wealthy. You heard Republicans in the House say, let's go back on more cuts. And you heard even Republicans and some Democrats in the Senate say, how about more money for the defense uh, industry or defense uh, uh, of the country? We don't think that they got enough for the Pentagon. So it's really not a closed deal. We have these appropriations bills that'll come up in the fall, they're going to relitigate a lot of these issues. And what Republicans are planning to do actually in the next couple weeks is they're going to try to um, start the process to extend the Trump tax cuts. And so Democrats are furious, saying, if you care about budget and government spending and reducing the deficit, extending the Trump tax cuts is not the way to do it. So you're right, there's going to be more budget fights ahead. Yay. Well, at least we all get to stay employed for a little bit longer. Um, Nicole, do you think that we in the political press at all overreacted to the threat, to the worry about a default. I mean, deadlines have an incredible way of quickening people's pulses and forcing action. There has been a fair amount of bipartisan reaction. I mean, do you think we got too worried about this, or do you think that there was an appropriate level of concern? Well, I think we were reporting what we were being told, which is that Janet Yellen sent letter after letter after letter to Congress saying, look, this is the date, and if you don't do anything, then we're going to have an economic catastrophe. So I don't think we in the press were blowing anything up. We were reporting what the Treasury Secretary was conveying to lawmakers, and clearly many of them felt, uh, whether it was Republicans or Democrats, bound by that deadline although you did have a number of Republicans who questioned the validity of the date and, you know, suggested that there could be some workarounds and the Treasury could do some things, you know, if, if that date approaches. But uh, the bottom line is that I think everyone took that date seriously because, as we saw with the Senate, they got this cleared in record time. Peter, the, Kevin McCarthy came through. He thinks of this as a success. At least that's how he's presenting it publicly. Yeah. Does this tell us something about how he might govern over the next couple of years vis-a-vis -vis the White House. I think it actually tells a lot more about Kevin McCarthy in some ways than Joe Biden, because we didn't know whether Kevin McCarthy was going to be serious about governing, right? In January, when he made it through those 15 ballots, he had to trade away the store to the hard right in his own caucus. And the question was, OK, does that mean he's now forever beholden to their priorities, or is he going to be able to make a compromise like he did with President Biden? He seems proud of the fact that he made a compromise. He seems actually to be perfectly comfortable that he came to the middle with the Democratic president that they tend to vilify and found that that's a better solution for the country, even at the expense of complaints on the right. Now, that doesn't mean that the people on the right are going to let it go. It may ultimately cost him down the road. But for the moment, I think he's shown that he does have at least some instinct for governing. I actually thought that was one of the interesting things about what the president said tonight, because he said, yeah. uh, with respect to bipartisanship, we can never stop trying. And one thing Speaker McCarthy has said repeatedly from his speakership fight onward is that he doesn't give up. So, right. you know, both of them conveying a sense of optimism going forward. Whether or not they continue working together, I think, remains well, to be he, seen. He praised McCarthy, which might not help McCarthy. <laughs> 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 uh, 